Good morning and welcome to our second pre-harvest webinar of the year series, uh, John Deere Yield Data, Getting It Right. This is part of uh, our Data and Tech series, um, which is hosted by Farm Plan and guest partners to explore the importance of making data and technology work for you to improve performance, better decision making and profitability. And uh, just want to start with um, the uh, introduction to the presenters. What we've got is uh, myself, Simon, I'm hosting the event and also regional account manager for the East and been working with Tuckwells and uh, other John Deere uh, dealers for, for many years. And of course, my colleagues are doing exactly the same throughout the UK. UK. I've got uh, Adam, who's our training and services manager, specializing in gatekeeper. And he's trained clients right the way uh, across the industry, obviously including growers, um, through to agronomists and uh, dealer specialists, as well as uh, even universities. So he's got a broad insight and uh, knowledge of, of farm plan and the industry. And then I've got my colleague, uh, Vicky, who's a uh, regional account manager like myself, who's covering the south of England. And uh, is uh, she's also pressing the buttons and driving the webinar today. Um, behind the scenes, we've got uh, Emily, and Emily is a team leader, but also one of the support angels uh, working for Gatekeeper and the accounts advice line. So for the next hour or so, she'll be behind the scenes and helping um, you guys. And if you've got any queries, uh, that will be sorted out, as Vicky will be saying, um, covering in the in the next few minutes. Um, and of course, uh, a big thank you and welcome to um, our guest partners, uh, Tuckwells today, who are flying the John Deere flag this morning. So to start off with, we've got uh, Adrian, who's been working with John Deere dealers since 1992, which is hard to believe. Uh, and uh, it's uh, he's based in Essex, or, although he can be found across, uh, and I've come across him in many branches uh, through through East Anglia and through into into the um, East Midlands. Uh, he's a technology specialist, so he majors in sort of in cab equipment and in turn integration with my John Deere and field management software such as Gatekeeper. And then we've got Chris and uh, George, who uh, are both uh, equally technology specialists and offering the same sort of expertise south of the Thames as they're both based in the, in the Kent. Um, so we've also got uh, Chris Shellac, who's farm manager for Tuckwell Farms, and uh, of course he uses both John Deere and Gatekeep technology on an everyday basis uh, on his working arable farm uh, in Mid Suffolk. Uh, so roughly over the next hour, the session we'll be looking at some of the simple ways to ensure smooth and accurate data flow and, and data capture. Um, we'll be covering some of the basic prep and best practices on the combine terminals as well as gatekeeper ready for harvest. And we'll finish off by looking at how you can get more usage and value out of the data. Uh, and in between time, you might be lucky enough to find out how you can save a little bit of money on the precision farming module. But just a quick whip through this agenda here. So we've got the user experience. So we're, we've got um, Chris uh, Shellac um, talking about um, his his experience, and I'll, I'll let sort of uh, Adrian sort of tee that up um, in a few minutes. Um, we've got uh, we're looking at both um, the pre-harvest uh, best practice on Gatekeeper and John Deere, and that will be with with uh, Adam for the Gatekeeper and um, both Chris uh, Chris Romney um, with Adrian there and also George. And then we'll be looking at uh, the way to tidy data once it gets into Gatekeeper and then what more you can actually do with it. And then finally, we'll be finishing off with uh, just a, a quick look at a, an offer that we've got open till uh, the end of July. And then we've got the questions. And like uh, uh, Vic said, you know, if you've got any questions that come to mind, don't wait until the end, just pop them in the uh, section there uh, and um, we can pick them up as the, uh, the webinar continues. So yeah, uh, I'll happily um, move over to uh, Adrian to pick things up um, and um, yeah if you want to uh, take things with um, with Chris and the user experience. Yeah thanks Simon. Um, morning everyone. Uh, firstly I'd like to just start by introducing a, a 10 minute pre-recorded session I did with with Chris Jellack uh, just to give you a flavour of some of the uses of data gathered on our own uh, Tuckwell farms. So uh, if you could just 
run the pre-recorded video, please. Hi, right, good morning, everyone on the uh, webinar. Uh, my name is Adrian Fullman. I'm here with Chris from Tuckwell Farms, uh, and Chris is just going to talk a little bit about the um, the farm structure and size and, and cropping mix. So, uh, over to you, Chris. Yes, good morning, everybody. Um, so, yes, I'm uh, Chris Shellac. I'm farm manager for for Tuckwells, Tuckwell Farms. Um, we're based in Hearth, Suffolk, uh, just outside of Framingham. So we're an arable enterprise. Uh, we farm roughly 1,800 acres, um, and cropping comprises of uh, wheat, which covers around 60% of our farmed area, and the remaining 40% is is uh, break crops. So we'll see grape, uh, peas, and parsley. Um, naturally, we're an all green uh, farming outfit. So uh, anywhere from the, the John Deere sprayer to the to the combine. Um, yeah, and we, you know, and, and actually a John Deere drill as well. Yeah, that's good. Um, just can you talk to us a little bit about um, previously where the farm was on the Precision Ag journey and, and um, you know, where you are now in terms of your, your kind of end goal, really? Yeah, sure. So, um, you know, I started four years ago um, at Tuckwells and um, at that point, uh, yield collecting yield data was probably uh, an, an auto section on the sprayer was, was about as much as, um, you know, the, the precision farming activities on the farm. Um, I think it's important to add, you know, before we sort of talk about where we're going is that, you know, I'm a true believer that technology isn't always um, a substitute for getting the basics right. Um, but one thing that we've been really trying to, to, to work hard at, you know, before we take anything to the next level is ensuring that, um, you know, we've got uh, good data flow on the farm, which means the data collected from the field goes into the tractor, comes back to the office as soon as possible. And the main reason why we look to do this is because it's very easy with data to end up with a data graveyard. Uh, and, and we have this huge amount of data that actually we don't do anything with. Um, and, you know, one of the best ways of, of, of getting informed decisions, um, you know, that we can act upon is, is through, through data that we're collecting every day on the farm. So, uh, you know, before we take it to the next level, um, you know, that, that, that's, that's the one thing that we've really been focusing on. Yeah, yeah. Um, so um, what are the main, you know, drivers for you to really collect the harvest data you know so why collect it in the first place um you know is it uh, sort of harvest yield maps is that a good place to start for people um you know? absolutely yeah no, no i'd say that's that is the probably the first place to start you know it's 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 the benchmark for you know everything that you, you do on farm isn't it you know if, if if you're investing in um you know new technology um you know whether it be some kind of variable rate uh, technology, you know, you need a way of quantifying what you're doing. You know, you need to quantify every, everything you're doing. And, you know, I, I feel that yield data is, is certainly the sort of the base point, if you like, uh, the foundation point, um, you know, where we where we um, can analyze, you know, what we've done throughout the, throughout the year. Um, I think the other thing that, that's, that's really, worth remembering about with, with when it comes to yield data is that you know we're collecting um you know huge amounts of, of, of cell data um it's cell data that's in a you know real common format whether it be shapefile or csv and what this means is we can we can move this data from one platform to another and in our case we, we'd move it from the op center uh to, to gatekeeper um and importantly when we've got cell data we can act upon it and we can manipulate it and, and we can turn it into, you know, something else, you know, a lot more meaningful and, and, and something else that we can act upon. Um, if I just share my um, share my screen. Yeah. So what I what I wanted to show you was something that's available to, to everybody to use in in Gatekeeper. Um, you, know, you do need the mapping module for this, I believe. Um, correct me if I'm wrong, Adam. Um, but this is this is basically a, a, a target map grid generator. So what this is doing, it's using cell data. In this case, it's it's from a, um, a yield map. 
And what I've been doing with this is creating um, uh, verbal rate potash, potash maps. So I'm replacing potash from what I've removed um, using harvest data. And it's very simple, what's called a computation. So it's looking at the cell data. And if the cell data is saying the yield was five ton a hectare, then the formula is saying that we're going to replace it with X amount of kilos of, of potash. So this is one real simple way which I've been using yield data to actually um, you know, use uh, or reapply um, nutrients in a, in a precision in a precision manner, you know, we're, we're replacing what we've we're taken away from the field effectively. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that that's a kind of quite a you know a basic kind of level that everyone could get to grips with. But um, yeah, what would be a kind of next level thing? You know, where would you take that? Um, you know, in terms yeah. of the next step. A really, really interesting um, uh, decision maker or, or um, you know, something that's going to give you an informed decision as to, um, you know, what you might want to do a field is, is, is a margin map. Now, this is using um, uh, yield data and it's it's sort of overlaying the, the uh, in this case, the variable costs over that or minusing them from your, um, so if you've got your yield, you've got your, uh, your, um, your, your gross margin in there. Um, and then it's minusing the, uh, in this case, just the variable costs. Um, you know, it's quite important to say we haven't taken the fixed costs out of here either. But from this, what you can see is actually probably more than 50% of this field is actually losing us money, particularly on this year when it was obviously rape. Um, now, one of the things we've done on this field is actually um, uh, taken two, two of these corners out of this field because we've consistently seen them, you know, not turning a profit for us and these are actually now in a mid-tier scheme um, as for the rest of the field it's um, it's quite an interesting field because it's it's really good soil it's it's quite deep um, you know deep topsoil uh, lovely clay loam but it's got um, you know it's got no drainage in it so we know this field has real good yield potential um, but it's just been underperforming purely because it's got no drainage in it so you know We've seen several years of data on this field, which looks very similar. Um, and on the back of that, we've we've kind of um, you know made that decision that actually we can afford to. Um, well, we've actually invested in our own drainage equipment um, on the back of this, you know, and we've seen this in multiple fields as well. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's given us a good example of a field where a decision has gone one way and taking land out of production. Do, do you have an example of, of something where you know there's a, a lot of extra potential for the field where you can you can really uh, you know push the yield? You know, example of a good yielding field. Yeah, yeah. So let's have a look at. Um, so this this field here is is, is um, you know a really um, good example, I guess, of. of um, uh, a field which has which has been been really good for us over the years. Um, so what I'm going to do here is just actually um, I'm going to split the screen so we can look at multiple years, um, multiple years. Of this uh, I just need to get this right. Okay, so we've got two years of data here, and and an actual fact, it you know it. it for the most part, it, it correlates. You know, we can see a high yielding um, strip through the middle. Um, what, what we can actually see on here is actually through the middle there, we've got a, a sort of a, a ridge, if you like. Um, and although you know, um, you know, we probably don't need to be making vast amounts of um, you know input changes to this field. Um, you know, there's a bit of levelling up to do. Actually, what we've, we've actually found with this field is because of this, this higher ridge in the middle there, these headlands, you know, joining with a bit of compaction, have actually, the water has actually been sitting on both sides of this, this field. Um, and, and we believe that was a big contributing factor to, um, you know, the, the sort of redu reduction in yield in here. So it's a management decision we've actually made from this. Is that we, we actually mold drain this last year, and um, yeah, we've seen a vast change in in the, uh, the water management on that field. Um, now, a quick, quick question from me to to, to, to Adam or, or, or everybody else who's on the call. Um, so I actually overlay my data in in the Ops Centre at the minute. So I'll take four or five years and lay them over, across one another and and create an average yield um, over a number of years. 
So, Adam, how would we how would we do this in Gatekeeper as opposed to having a split screen? How do we overlay multiple years of of, of view of data? Yeah, because that would give you a more you know consistent average, wouldn't it? Uh, be quite a useful metric almost. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, okay. So um, that's given us a bit of flavour there. Um, would you have any sort of tips and best practices uh, for maintaining this accurate data and you know just a, a next step uh, just to keep up to speed with the digital technology? Well, um, plan, 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 plan. Um, if if you haven't started planning for harvest and all the operations uh, involved in harvest, then then start planning now. You know, the day before is, is always too late. Um, yeah. But these are things like um, ensuring that the uh, recording height of your header is set correctly for the, the appropriate crop is a real is a real interesting one because that can have quite a, a big a big effect on the you know the data that comes back in and how clean and tidy it is. Um, the other thing I'd probably add is that if you're investing in technology, invest in training. You know, it, it, there's no point spending huge amounts of money on software platforms and the, the hardware that goes with it if you don't do the training. You'll only get the most out of it with training. You know, I've spent several hours or a lot of hours with Adam and, you know, asked him probably some questions which he thinks, what's this guy on? But you know, I've, I've got a huge amount out of it. So, you know, be prepared to to um to invest time and money into it yeah sure okay well thanks for your time this morning chris um you know that's given everyone a good yeah, good flavor good and good uh, flavor. Have, uh, a good, uh, have a good uh, okay. rest of the day rest of the day thanks, thanks. Thank you. okay thanks thank you. yep okay well uh thanks to uh, chris for that um we've seen a little bit how chris was using some of his data there um, so I'd like to tee up and introduce the first poll question, if I could, um, just to see where you all are on your own data journey. So we'll, uh, we can just tee up that question, please. Yep. I'll just launch the poll in just a second. So you'll see it come onto your screen. Um, and the question that we're asking today is, are you using your data for any further analysis at the moment? I've got a few more coming in. Just wait for everyone to have a vote. I think we've probably nearly got most people. We'll share the results with you as well so you can um, sort of see the percent percentage on the call. Hopefully you'll be able to see the results there. That's really interesting. Mm. That's well. So I think um, now we're going to hand over to Adam um, to take us into the next section. Yep. Thank you, Vicky. Um, and <coughs> thanks to you, um, Adrian, for that recording there. And the um, interesting that was a, quite encouraging on the poll responses there. There's quite a lot of you already engaging with your data and, and, and making use of it. Um, whether that's quite in the same way that Chris was, I thought there were some really, really good, insightful ways that he was making the most out of, of what he was, um, what he, he's bringing in um, from from tractor units, from from combine every year, and, and making the most out of that data. And we'll we'll talk about that and revisit some of that later on in. In the webinar, and I will answer. Come across to um, Chris's question about uh, aggregating multiple years of data as well. But before we get to that point, like Chris alluded to, it's in the planning and the preparation. Um, the seven Ps: you know, prior preparation and planning, and, and it's all. It, it's the same when it comes to collecting data um, and, and getting getting your, your house in order. Really, on the gatekeeper side of things, and, and the guys from from John Deere are going to talk about getting things ready to go and prepping it all from, from their side as well. So just a little couple of tips from me. 
a few things to talk about. First of all, you've probably seen in, within the one of the most recent updates that we've actually changed the device sync screen on here. So when you click on device sync um, with your chosen um, device, you'll now be brought to this window and rather with the where we had the old import and export tabs, and that's now changed to a local exchange and a cloud exchange. That's because we're seeing more and more manufacturers and John Deere, one of the first ones of those to bring in the wireless data transfer. We've now got the option so you choose whether you're going to go down the cloud exchange route or whether you're going to go local exchange, i.e. a USB device to bring data back and forth. Um, and it's really just horses for courses, which ones you prefer. But we are starting to see both more manufacturers introducing this, but more people starting to see the benefits and go down this route as well um, and, and see some of that. So I'll let um, Adrian, Chris and George talk about that probably from, from what they're seeing on their side of things. When you're within that cloud exchange button then or the local exchange, um, you'll then be able to do the import, export or download and upload um, to bring your data in. Um, in the top right hand corner, it's a little bit small, but that's just with reference to the peculiarities or one of the idiosyncrasies we've got with the John Deere um, import and export. And that is that your crops and varieties have to be set up correctly. I'm sure I'm already preaching to the converted of most people on this call are already syncing data with Gatekeeper. I'm sure you know that to link your um, for the crop to appear on the screen, it's got to be linked at the crop level. So obviously we have the hierarchy in Gatekeeper where you have the crop group, which is where we do our checking against it with Sentinel. Then you have the crop name, and it's at the crop name where you associate that uh, with the correct specified John Deere crop on there. Um, one thing that often gets forgotten though is that your variety list must be unique as well. So sometimes people will set up um, a, a second crop name. So they'll have barley spring like on the list there and then spring barley or wheat, wheat winter and then winter wheat or W wheat or something. Try and make sure that you've got no varieties that are doubled up in those two places. Varieties must be unique within that list, otherwise that will cause you problems on the export as well. Interestingly, we mentioned this on one of our other webinars as well, and what some people didn't realise was it, there's a place to enter your moisture figure, both at the crop level and the output product level as well. So it's on this screen as well, and it's just hidden there below the other one, but where you go and link your John Deere crop up, there's also a box to put in a moisture figure. And what Gatekeeper will do is if that is filled in, Gatekeeper will do its best to try and reduce the, the, the yield data that's coming in, the wet weight from the combine that's coming in and that raw data, and it will perform a moisture shrink calculation automatically as the data is brought in the Gatekeeper, bringing it down. So you've got two options. You can put it in at the crop level or you can put it in at the product level. But if you do put it against your output products, that wins out over the crop level. So it's probably just better to put a generic figure in um, up against the crop there. And then the last thing on my list really to talk about is um, field boundaries. Um, like Chris mentioned, and I mentioned it all the time, it's all about the preparation. And I, this is really a sort of call to arms and, and a plea, if you will, that try to sort of treat your boundary management exactly the same way as you treat your cropping setup every year. It's within the same part of the area, part of the program. So we've got the cropping record there. You're inside the cropping record once a year anyway. You've got to come down that list and populate those crops within that cropping record. The region tab is just a little way across from that. And there under the region tab, you can select the current shape for that particular field in that year. So regions are a little bit like templates. You can have as many regions stored against the cropping record as you like or within the field. Um, and that represents the cropped area, the crop shape of, of the production area of that field within that year. And you can ch keep changing that year on year so to represent the, the true working area of that field every year. And it is just worth, as you're doing your crops, going to check in that boundary is correct, because there's nothing worse than when you come to bring data in, you have to fiddle about, start changing boundaries or realize even worse than that, you haven't got a boundary set up for that field. And then it gets even worse if we're trying to export variable rate application plans and things like that back out to tractor units without that set up properly. So just a few bits and pieces on there. Um, and the other things would be to make sure that all your products are set up correctly, your harvest products, your output products. And how you do those is, is entirely up to you. Multiple ways you could approach that. But it all comes down to, like everything I say, is think about the output. How do you want to use the data or what do you want to report on afterwards? So if you want to go by variety and you want to have, you're going to see premiums on certain varieties, well, that's fine. Set your output products up and, and have more of them, but you're going to have to factor that in when you create your harvest plan or just set them up generically. Set up a generic product called milling wheat or just wheat. Um, but it all depends on how you're going to report on that and the pricing you want to assign to that product afterwards. 
um, which then leads on to the all important, which I'm sure so many of you heard us bang on about more than once, is creating a harvest plan. Um, you, you know, with the John Deere terminals, uh, especially with the 2630 display, that integration is as is, is, is good as it's going to get. Um, and everything goes from gatekeeper, machines, implements, crops, varieties, and the job and the work plan itself, if that's got multiple jobs in it, all going to appear out there on the, on the box as well. Even if you haven't, so the Gen 4 at the moment can't take the harvest plan out there. It can take a, a 2630 profile, but it can't have a work plan out at the moment. But you still ought to be creating a harvest work plan ready for the data to be coming back into, um, because that structure of the work plan is not only going to help you um, import the data quicker, but it's also going to make the management and the tidying and the filtering out and cleaning up of that data much quicker as well, which we're going to look at in the later section after this. So I think I'm ready to pass back and look at some of the housekeeping tips now from the uh, John Deere side of things. So uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Adam. Um, so we've done a bit of setup with Gatekeeper. We're now out to the machine and where do we start? So first thing we want to do is we want to make sure that the screens are clean of any old historical data. We don't need anything propping up later in the and later in the import process that's going to trip us over and, and potentially muddle some of that data. So good place to start clearing out the data. You'll see on the screen we've got uh, four images. The top two are for the 2630 system, Greenstar 3, and the bottom two are the newer Gen 4 system. So on the 2630, um, if you're exporting and, and refreshing the profile from Gatekeeper, it might be less of a problem because it will overwrite any of the data on there. But if you want to clear out your documentation data, go into your memory tab, hit the arrays data, and then the one you're looking for just to delete the, the historical documentation is documentation data. Tick that, hit begin removal, and then you've got nothing historical on there to, to trip you over later. Slightly different on the Gen 4, you need to go into uh, file manager, and then the one you're looking for is work data. Being John Deere, we love to change the terminology, so just be aware that it is work data in the Gen 4 and the documentation data in the 2630. Next slide, please. Next, after that, the next bit, not only to make sure that your auto track is performing uh, to the best of its abilities, but also to make sure that the yield maps are recording correctly. You want to make sure all your offsets are right. So depending on what header combine combination you've got, they're all going to be subtly different. Um, so it is worth just making sure, even if they've come pre-populated from the factory, I'm holding my hands up here, get the tape measure out and double check them. Go into, on the, on the 2630, go into your equipment manager, double check what it's saying. If they're zero, there's a good chance they might need edit, ed editing out. Um, check them, measure them, make sure they're right. And on the 4600, just go in and make sure that the profiles are correct again in equipment manager. Now, once you've done that, if you then take that data back to Gatekeeper, you can be pretty confident next year when you do this export. Again, they will be correct. But here's one of my best practice guides. Always check, make sure they're right before you start. Next slide, please. So after you've created the job and you've exported that out in whichever way, whether it's wireless data transfer or using a USB device, uh, when it arrives on the 2630, um, the nice thing about the work plan is it will pre-populate, as Adam said, pre-populate everything for you. So it, it's fairly straightforward to do. It's all found under the summary tab. And what you'll notice after you've selected the job, it will pre-populate. Everything will be filled out in there in one go. So you click on the job and then it will load up the, uh, the job list. So if you've got a different job as per prop, for instance, you'll see all of those listed just like you do next uh, in, in image two there. And then once you go through from there, go through the job notes. So if there's anything noted that needs to be aware for an operator, you see that. And then finally, you get through to your job details. At the bottom there, you'll see uh, your field list. You click on that and you'll see all the fields that are associated to that individual job. Next slide, please. Once you've selected the correct field, you'll then go back. And as I said, in image five, you're going to see everything is pre-populated. You'll see your crop type, you'll see your equipment. Uh, you'll see the job name, 
um, variety, anything like that that's been that's been set up in that job profile. After you've selected that, all you need to do is make sure that you've got your key and your map settings set for yield so that you can actually physically view the yield as you're going. And then in item seven, you can actually populate that key. So again, if you were combining uh, or harvesting obviously rape, your key would be slightly different to show you what was good and what was poor than it would be on a winter wheat crop. So you can then tailor that in number seven there. Um, one thing to remember, when you finish a job, uh, there are two options. You can either interrupt or you can complete. If you interrupt the job, you can then restart it. If you, if you complete it, that is it done. You, you need to, you'll need to reload the job to be able to start that again. So it's one of those things just to remember. I always refer to interrupt as pause and complete as your stop button, just like it would be on your TV remote, just so that you know which one you're which one you're using. Next slide, please. Slightly different on the Gen 4. Uh, in the bottom left-hand corner, you will see the setup icon. Again, it's very similar to under that summary tab. You click on that and everything is then accessible from this single place. So you've got your field locations, your client, your farm, your field information. Underneath that, you've got your equipment. And on the right-hand side, you've got your um, crops and varieties. Each of those red icons there are a hotkey. So if you click on where it says um, your, your plant farm field, so it will say South 40 in this example, click on there, it will automatically pre-populate or pre-load you into your fields and boundaries tab. So everything that you need to set up is all accessible um, from in this one page. So it's, it's, it's a very quick and easy setup. It's just a slightly different way of doing it than it is on, a, on the 2630. So um, that's very quick overview of the screens there for, for setting up. I'm just gonna hand back to, to Adrian now, who's gonna talk through a bit more of the calibration side and some of the key bits you need to be aware of. Yep, thank you, Chris. If we can just move on to the next slide. Um, so first thing yeah, we've mentioned, uh, Chris did off the farm about record stop height. So briefly, what is that? Well, it's the it's a recording trigger. So every, every piece of kit you have has some method of switching the recording on and off for documentation. So um, on the uh, upper two screenshots there, that's how you would find the record stop height set on a 2630 type screen. Um, and basically, what you would need to do is set the crop the header just slightly above your actual cutting height and then hit the enter button there and it would then record that as the new stop height. Um, on the lower part of the screen you'll see it on the Gen 4 screen. Um, it's how you get to that through main menu and then machine and then there's a, a button to do with the header so that would be in there. Exactly the same procedure then so set the header just above your cutting height and hit the record stop height um, button there. So um, that has a big effect on how tidy the data is because obviously what you don't want it doing is recording as you're going down the road or out and onto another field. Um, Adam will speak a little bit later on about tidying up data and this can really help that process you know, right from the get-go. So if we just move on to the next slide, please. So another thing just to uh, pre-harvest prep, um, get your mass flow and moisture sensors all, all cleaned out. It may have been you, you were harvesting in some dirty crops at the tail end of last season and there's a dirt accumulation. So you'll see in the upper left and upper right pictures there's the mass flow sensor, uh, different designs depending on the combine you have. Um, so make sure that curved uh, impact plate is, is all clean, there's no dirt build up behind that because that can really affect the yield figures as, as they come in. Um, and then again, different moisture meters. The, the central one is more on the S series combine, and then the upper right hand picture shows the, the top end of the plunger on the, the T series. So, again, make sure those are clean and, and they're cycling properly, um, ready for the, the new harvest. Um, as regards yield calibration, obviously, um, some of you may or may not have weigh bridges, so. Um, that makes life a lot easier if you have. You can then calibrate your yield loads against those. Um, the later S-series combines have a feature called active yield. Um, if you see in the lower left-hand picture, they have sensors within the grain tank. 
and that can actually then calibrate itself as it's going along. And the, this screen will just accumulate calibration loads as it's going. So, um, so you know, I think we'll see more of that technology coming on. And again, that will that will keep uh, yield maps you know really tidy going forwards. So if we could just move on to the next slide, please. So I want to talk a little bit about um, exporting data. Yeah, you know, once you've done the harvest. Um, so there's two methods really. And the first slide here is to do with, with wireless. So again, the upper two screens are for a generation three display, 2630, and the lower is for a generation four. Um, the process should be automatic and fairly seamless, but you've just got to make sure that you have the, the settings set to uh, upload data automatically. So on the 2630 screen, uh, the little button with the red box around it is the data transfer settings. And you'll see like in the upper right hand screen there, there's a drop down which says automatically. So you can set that to manual or automatic. So I'd recommend automatically for that. Um, the lower screen, it shows within the system file manager. Um, if we move on to the lower right hand screen, it, it should all then have a, a green LED. Uh, which then says it's ready and it's hooked up to your My John Deere organization. Um, and then that will uh, be sending data automatically back there. Um, there's a much faster data, well, there's much more data, as we'll see a bit later, um, uh, comes out of a Generation 4 display and it, it would sync every 30 seconds or so um, just to get that volume of data back in. So those will go into the operations center and then you can pull them back out to tie with your gatekeeper work plan. So if we just move on the next slide, please. So the second method um, was be via USB stick. So if you have a machine that doesn't have our Jamie Link system on it with telematics, you can still USB the data out. So in the upper part of the screen there is 2630. As soon as you put the USB stick in, so I mean the 2630 screen is about a one gig memory, so a four gig stick would be, would be adequate. Pop the stick in and it will automatically come up with a data transfer window. So at that point, I would suggest um, a good tip is to actually name the profile that you're exporting, something to do with, with harvest or um, it could be uh, rape or wheat if you're doing it during the harvest, um, but make a reference to this data set as you name the new profile. So that makes life a lot easier in, in Gatekeeper. You can um, specify that drive path and pick that heading up within Gatekeeper when you're bringing the, the uh, work data back in. Um, on Generation 4 display, in the bottom part of the screen there, you'll see uh, you can export similar work data. Um, unfortunately, when you're doing it via a Gen 4 screen, you can't actually name that profile. It automatically um, will just appear as JD4600 um, on the USB. So we just have to make sure um, to pick that drive path up within Gatekeeper when we're bringing the data in. Okay, um, one thing I would say with Generation 4 screens, like I mentioned earlier, they do accumulate probably about 10 times as much data as a Generation 3 screen. So I would really, um, you know, a good tip would be little and often. Um, Try, you know, every few days, probably USB your harvest data out. Um, definitely don't leave it till the end of harvest um, and do the whole lot um, because it could cause hang ups and, and all sorts of things like that. So, uh, yeah, little and often. Okay, if you can just move on to the next slide, please. So, as Adam mentioned a little bit earlier, um, the different data windows there on Gatekeeper. Um, so you can then bring data in from the operation center via the cloud exchange. So basically up the top right hand tab at the top, I know it's quite small, but uh, it would say cloud exchange. So what you would do uh, is then hook up, there's a little uh, round and round green arrows there. Um, so you can then refresh and actually put in your ID number, your My John Deere username and password. Um, and then click, uh, and Gatekeeper would then be linked to your My John Deere Operations Center. So that will enable you to then pull data straight out of the op center file system. Um, it would then show, I've only got a single red line here, but it would show as if data had come in via USB stick. So you can manipulate the data from that point 
exactly the same as it would if it came in via um, via a USB. So I think uh, that's that's pretty much it. Um, so I'll just hand you over to George quickly, who will mention um, a little bit about our dealer support. Thank you, George. Hi there, everyone. So yeah, I think everything we've spoken about so far today is all around planning um, and getting on top of data and making sure naming conventions and everything set up. Now, one thing when we go out and have conversations is also the the amount of time that takes up. So Tapwells, we offer a pre-harvest setup and optimization support package. Now, there's no fixed cost to this because, like all these things, there's no fixed problem. Um, so what we offer is we can come out and have a look at the data if it's sim simply cleaning up fields and boundaries and making sure naming conventions are right. As Adam pointed out earlier, it can be a real pain in terms of getting accurate yield back in and having historic data to be able to cross reference. We offer a package to run through obviously everything we've spoken about today um, to ensure that that data has come across and is input correctly. And we can even come out post harvest to help with getting that data back into operation center and obviously tied back up into Gatekeeper. Um, alternatively, if you're outside of Tuckwell's air responsibility, um, contact your local John Deere dealer um, and see if they've got anything available. I know most of sort of our colleagues up around the country have a sort of harvest and um, support plan. But one thing I would um, sort of press home is obviously harvest is creeping up on us. So please get in contact um, and we'd be more than happy to arrange a meeting to run through that. So I will hand back over now. Adam, I think uh, we're looking at PEMs um, tidying data now. Yeah, cool. thanks for that. Um, so we, um, we've got all our data um, out to the combine successfully. Um, set the combine's been set up. We've we had stop heights and everything been set correctly, and hopefully we re we're starting to record some good data. But all the preparation that we do, we're still going to encounter some challenges when we're combining in the field. Um, and this slide that I've got in front of us here is just to go through some of those challenges and talk about what might happen um, while we're trying to record yield data um, and while we're actually going through the combine operation itself. Um, and then I'm going to talk about how we can fix those once that data is back into Gatekeeper. Um, so the numbered slide that you can hopefully all see in front of you on there, starting from the top, number one, which is the headland area you can see around that field there. Um, that's actually caused by calibration issues. You know, Adrian touched on that. Um, and that's exactly what's happened here. So the, the, the run of the, 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 um, the headland cut that's around the outside of that field, <clears throat> excuse me, um, was actually done by a separate combine. So two different separate files have been brought into Gatekeeper here and pieced into the into the one field, but they were running different calibrations, and that's why we're seeing an artificially low yielding headland around the outside of that. So that can happen, but that can be fixed post harvest when we bring that data back in. Um, you might not be able to quite see it, but just next to the number two there, there's a little very low yielding spot, and then it resumes back into the rest of the normal pattern that we're seeing on that run. And sometimes we see fake um, or, or, or sort of um, adversely affected plots, which aren't really there, that are affected by difficult combining conditions. So if we've got wet or lodged crops and we get a blockage and that suddenly clears again, we might suddenly get a very low yielding spot followed up by a high one as the crop material starts flowing back up again through there and hitting the mass flow sensor like we saw in Adrian's slide. Again, we can filter out some of these artificially um, unrealistic spots on here as well. All the way around the edge of that field, you can see sections where right at the end, we got very, very low yielding spots on there. And that's caused by both start and end of pass delay. Um, and this is, again, something that we can correct out of there. But you will start seeing that. So that's just going to be a normal part of combining. As we start to slow down at the end or as we start into the run, you're going to have a, a difference um, in, in the, the rate of crop material that's being fed up the auger in front of the, the mass flow sensor. Um, to, to start recording. So you get these artificially low yielding spots at the end of there. Field shape is going to play a part on there as well because we don't have nice square perfect fields. They're all going to be irregular shapes um, and we're going to have to come back and we're going to tr be traveling over previously cut swaths. So we're going to have to come back and pick up 
little bits and pieces that we've done before there. And around about number four, as we're coming back onto that headland, the field shape there is actually causing the yield to look low when it actually wasn't. It's just to do with the, the header width and what was being picked up at that time and how much material was being averaged over that header width on there. Um, and then number five, you might have picked these out yourself without the numbers, but you can see sort of two, um, two lines that sort of converge, that converge down from the top left and the top right in there down towards the bottom of the field looking like we've got stripes running down the field. And if we didn't know better, um, we'd think that that was just poor, poor um, yielding in those areas. In that particular field, actually, they're two footpaths that are causing this. And I think this goes back to what Chris referenced in the video, that technology is great and we, need to, we can use it effectively, but we still need to couple that with a good understanding and knowledge of the land that we're working as well to interpret that data correctly. So those are some of the challenges that we can we can face when we're trying to combine them, which can create us anomalies and errors that shouldn't be there in our data um, when we captured it. So if your data is coming back into Gatekeeper, we can put all that right there. We can start to tidy this up. So once that data has been brought back into the job, um, we can, we're can we now in the job screen. So the main picture on your screen there is the job screen. And down at the bottom of that, you've got the little fields tab. And the fields tab is where we start to access the spatial information within that job. There's a little sub menu to the left of the um, contour map that we can see on the side there. And that's where we can start to, to um, expose different layers. So we can see the route trace, we can see the raw data plots, or we can see the contour map or whatever it is we want to look at on there. And just to the left of that list, you've got two very helpful buttons, one to calibrate the job and one to filter the, filter the plots out. So what we receive back into Gatekeeper is actually the raw data from the combine. We don't do anything else. We don't try and prettify it. We don't try and adjust it apart from that moisture, moisture shrink figure I mentioned at the start. What we receive back is what was recorded on the controller in the cab at the time of harvesting. And that's what you're being displayed back in your Gatekeeper. What we can do, though, is that one of the things that we want to do when the data comes back in is filter the plots. And this is going to help us clean up the yield data for some of those errors that we saw on the previous side of the screen. So down in the bottom left hand side there, the, the arrow that's coming away from the filter plots, what we do in here is we set up a template and we don't need to set this up every year. You set this up as a template so you can run it quickly every year to clean your data in quite an efficient process. And we'll set, for example, on there minimum and maximum rates. So our, our realistic lowest and realistic highest spot rates on that field and anything outside of those parameters gets discounted um, by the system and it's represented by a little empty gray circle. Now we never ever delete the raw data on there. We just simply hide, when we're using the plot filters, we're just hiding that from the grid um, so that it doesn't get taken into account. For example, uh, like Chris's um, offtake map that he was creating on there, we don't want these erroneous figures being tracked translated into an application figure for fertilizer or anything else afterwards so we hide it from the grid and then there's a whole other range of things in there that we can do to tidy up the data to overcome those uh, challenges that we saw on the last slide so we can put in filters for, for for header widths for minimum and maximum widths we can put in speed ranges because traveling too fast too slow can actually cause us to see artificially low or high yielding spots on there if anybody's working in an area where we've got where they've got significant um, inclines or slopes, sometimes you will see stripy yield data coming down the slope. And what that is, that's a similar effect where we've got a too fast or too slow forward speed. And as we're traveling up, we're not getting the same material as when we're traveling down being presented in front of the, the flow sensor. So we're seeing artificially um, low and high alternate um, yielding stripes as we're coming down that. Now that can be fixed with a mixture of the, the minimum and maximum rate um, levels, but also the speed filters on there as well. And then we've also got a starter pass delay filter to rule out um, the, the when you're starting in that run and we're getting um, lower yielding areas on there. <clears throat> the other thing to clean it up that we can do is like in that example I saw there, there were two combines in that field, both with different calibration figures on there. Well, the calibrate job function allows you to tackle that two ways. 
So you, if you know the figure, you can use the calibration figure and make the, the second combine match the first one, and then both running on the same cal factor so that those two yield figures are, are, are looking true together. Or we can do it based upon weight as well. So you, it's probably very small on there, but the second radio button in on the bottom uh, of that screen at the top is new subtotal quantity. So if you've got Weybridge figures or if you know uh, you've got information coming back into the office about what was taken off which field, we can correct that from within the job in Gatekeeper using that subtotal quantity figure and it straights out there. It keeps the proportions of what you're seeing in the contour map exactly the same, but it just tweaks it up and down as necessary um, to make the, the true weight fit those contours. The other way you could do it, you could approach it from the other end, so if you don't have Weybridge figures or anything else coming in during harvest, it doesn't matter because we can tidy up the stock. So if all your if all the um, your grain sales are being recorded out through Gatekeeper, you're recording the deliveries as they go, eventually you'll be left with something to tidy up in stock and do a stock reconciliation with, and we'll have a true figure of what was sold. Well, we can then recalibrate your job back off all of that true tidied um, sold weights that we've got in our stocking gatekeeper and we can correct the maps that way as well so you can tackle it from either way from the job or from the stock end um, and like I say with all those tools in there we should end up with a nice um, realistic um, and accurate set of yield data that we can start then using to inform decisions start using to investigate things with or as Chris was doing creating variable applications with that can be based on on true um, reflection of the yield in there. Because if we don't clean our yield data up, there are penalties, we, even, you know, so you've got an economic um, penalty potentially. If we're working on, on poor, uncleaned yield data, we could be over applying fertilizer onto that field. Um, so aside from the economic um, impact on that one, you potentially got some yield limiting or, or, or other factors affecting there if you're not returning the correct level of nutrient back to that if you're doing an offtake map for example so it is really important to get that yield data cleaned up and, and a bit more accurate for all sorts of reasons once it's back in gatekeeper and this is where the harvest plan comes into its own because we can go through job by job and clean up multiple fields at once without it becoming a really tiresome process so just to finish then, um, talking about some of the things that we can um, do with that yield data once it's back in Gatekeeper. And I don't need to expand too much on here because Chris gave some brilliant examples earlier about how he's using that. Um, and it'd be great to hear from the audience as well what sort of things that you're doing with your yield data. Now, the, in the top right, we've got the variable rate activity. So as Chris said, there's a lot you can do just with your Gatekeeper program alone. If you're working with a service provider, that's great. You can bring in the prescription files into Gatekeeper and then pass them out to, you, to your John Deere equipment. Or you can be creating some of those variable rate um, application maps yourself within Gatekeeper. So if you've got the John Deere devices module on in Gatekeeper, you've got the grid generator. And the grid generator is that fantastic tool that Chris showed us where we can set up computations that can look at multiple data sources. So for example, we could combine um, our yield data with a layer of sampling data or other zone data that you've made up in there. And the grid generator can take into all those factors at once and create variable application maps for us um, after that to start using our yield data for. Um, in the bottom right hand corner, you've got some practical use of the margin maps that Chris showed us. So he was actually saying about areas of, of land that he's taken out of production. Um, this gentleman that, that feels that you can see in the bottom right hand corner there, that's another John Deere customer up in Yorkshire. And what he did, he used his margin maps to create the ponds that you can see in the corners of those fields. So he's a very good gatekeeper user. Everything's John Deere on that, that outfit as well, but everything gets passed through gatekeeper out to the John Deere terminals, back into gatekeeper. So he's got a very um, nice, tidy, consistent, complete set of data in there to make some accurate margin maps with. Um, and what he did was there were non-profitable areas of those fields. So he dug those big ponds in, you can see, and he had his land drained into those. Um, and that, fit, I think it was taken 2018, 19, particularly wet start of the year. And you can see how he is compared to his neighbor's fields set around there. And that was genuinely coming from the use of his yield data and as applied data, he was bringing back into Gatekeeper. And the question, just to end on, that, that Chris asked, is about aggregating um, multiple years worth of data all together in Gatekeeper. There's a really great feature that I'm very keen on in Gatekeeper uh, in the farm mapping module. It's one of the geoanalysis queries that you can create, and that is to create normalized yield maps. 
Now, a normalized yield figure, what Gatekeeper does, it takes the yield data over a, a number of years that you specify, and that could be anything from sort of two, three years, all the way to 10, 15 years worth of data, depending on how much you've got. Um, and just on that point, actually, it's never too late to start bringing it into Gatekeeper. If you haven't done so already, there is a historic yield maps import function. So we can start to backdate and push back into Gatekeeper historic yield maps if it's going to help you um, create a basis for, for doing things going forward. But when we create those normalized variations, what we're doing is we're overlaying the multiple yield maps on top of each other. And with Gatekeeper's running quite a sophisticated normalization, um, it's like a statistical averaging process that it does. So it's converting from tons per hectare into a percentage figure on there. So it takes the mean yield from those different crops. So if we had all seed rape, it'd be one to five and it would work out what's in the middle. If we had wheat the next year, it would work out what's the middle of that range between the highest and lowest. And it converts that into a percentage figure. So the yellow and uh, sort of gray areas you can see on that field, they are the mean for the last sort of four or five years of data that are on that field. So that's the average performance. Where you start to see the green areas, we're now talking that they are consistently over time 20 to 30 percent better performing than the other areas and that yellow and red section in the middle there well that's 30 40 percent poorer than the average across the years that we're looking at and that's why normalized yield variations are very very useful because just looking at a single yield map making decisions off off the back of that um, we need to be cautious about that because we could see things that aren't really there so there might be something just an anomaly in one year that makes our yield map look different once we start to overlay it and we get multiple years building up in there, we're starting to see true patterns of long-term um, sort of effects on that field or what might be happening there. Like Chris said, that we can then justify the expense of, of going in and putting some drainage in that field or something if we can see this long-term pattern building up. So I think that brings us um, up to the hour then. I think there's um, one more poll just to check everyone's still with us on the end of this one here. <laughs> minute if I didn't yeah. people sleep on there. Thanks Adam, that, no that was really great. Um, so the second poll that we've got for you today is um, after sort of going through the webinar with us, um, would you now consider using your data for analysis purposes? So I'll just launch that now. for a few more responses to come in. Out of a few people that are asleep, nearly everyone's voted. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's pretty profound. Oh, they, they've woken up, they've woken up. <laughs> So That's we, we've, we've, the interesting response coming in, we've either inspired people there or it's just the one person. Don't I, think, <laughs> um, I think all the guest speakers and Adam, you'll be very pleased with the, the response there. So I'll share the results on the screen for you all. That's got to be a record, I think, hasn't it? <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Plan. That's really, really good to hear. Full engagement. Fantastic. That's brilliant. Um, yeah, so I will now pass over to Simon, who's just going to run through um, an offer that we have um, running at the moment, which you will also be able to see on your screens as well. And then we'll move forward to the Q&A. Thanks, Vic. Yeah, it's uh, as I say, just before we dive into the, the questions, um, just working along sort of the, the theme of trying to get everybody getting the most out of, out of uh, software and out of the data. We've, we're trying to make it a bit, a bit more appetizing with regards to getting the mapping switched on with the John Deere devices. So um, we're running this offer till the end of the 31st, or well, the end of July, 31st of July. Uh, and uh, what would normally be a, a 798 price is uh, 248, sorry, 548. So 250 pound off. Uh, so as a considerable discount to to try and entice people to, to use it and get on board this year, this harvest, and uh, and make that move. Um, the other the other thing that came up with uh, Adam yesterday, who had a client who was running mapping, uh, but not John Deere devices. Um, John Deere devices on its own would normally be 175, uh, and uh, we're doing that at 125 at the moment. So again, uh, a big percentage off. 
and enough to make the move this year. Um, but yeah, we'll certainly, if you are interested, want to learn a little bit more about it, then um, call our sales number um, shown at the bottom there, and we'll be happy happily talk you through that and uh, what's what's involved um brilliant well i'll, I'll move you on to the the questions and um vic can pick up and like i say with those questions some might be more on a uh, individual basis that we'll be getting back to you later um but otherwise we'll we'll go through uh what's come in over the uh, over the webinar um spend five or ten minutes having a look at that thanks that's brilliant thank you simon um I will now read out the questions. So we have a question here. Um, is all the data integration discussed available with Gen4? It's open to, to anybody. I think that must have been an early question early on. <laughs> yeah, so I think probably right. we covered that. So um, a little bit. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, the only thing um, that we're really missing with the generation four would be the actual work plan um, item as, as such. Um, like um, yourself and, and Adam mentioned earlier, you can actually export all of your clients' farms, fields, um, machinery lists, setting out you know in a generation three format into the Gen four display. Um, you know, and then as the work data is recorded. It then comes back in, and like Adam said earlier, you know, if, you, if you've got your harvest work plan set up, you know, you've done all the hard work, you know, and then so that that data flow is pretty seamless within Gatekeeper. Um, but again, the only thing we're missing on the Gen 4 is the actual um, ability to funnel that up as as the work plan in inverted commas. But um, but yeah, apart from that, that answers the question. Adam, would you add any more to that? But, Brilliant. Um, uh, we've got another question. Oh, sorry, Adam. Okay. Oh, no, no, I was, yeah, no, I was going to say to Agent, uh, answer Agent there. I think that that's, that sums it up. Yep, yeah, you got the um, you obviously export a profile out through the um, through through Gatekeeper, which the, can be ingested by the Gen 4 screen. Um, and I believe tasks or jobs are sort of coming down the line on the Gen 4 screen. Um, so that, that, that functionality will be there in earlier. And just to go back to a point Adrian made as well, actually earlier on in the webinar, little and often, and I would kind of reinforce and echo that point on there, especially with your yield data. If, the, if, there's, if there are people on the call who've got generation four screens in their combines, um, then I would recommend quite strongly that you try and get data in little and often as you can on there. That new, the new ADAPT framework that that new Gen 4 data is built on is 10 times bigger than the file that used to come in from the, John, from the Generation 2630 displays. So it does take long to process each one as it comes into Gatekeep on there. So there is a bit of time lag on that. So it's going to be very painful if you're sitting there with 25, 30, 40 fields at the end of harvest trying to bring all of those in at one point. Unless you've got the serious sort of supercomputer, it will collapse and have a bit of a nightmare trying to do that many at once. So it's kind of little and often um, on your yield data. Um, and just, I think Ian Smith had a question on um, yield data going from the op center into Gatekeeper, but that came in as I think AD was talking about that. So yeah, once you set up your device in Gatekeeper, you link it via the John Deere API back up there just with your John Deere credentials. Um, and that will then, like Adrian explained, flow back into Gatekeeper through the download uh, feature there. Brilliant, thanks guys. Um, so we've got another couple of questions coming in. We've got one, um, do I need variable rate or completed variable rate job data to build a margin map? Uh, so I'll take that one. Um, if you have it, if you are engaged in variable rate activity, I would say that yes, it's best practice to bring that as applied data back into Gatekeeper um, because it's going to give you the most accurate margin map that you're going to see building up on there. If you can't get the as applied back in for some reason, don't forget if you get the prescription in Gatekeeper, if the prescription originated in Gatekeeper a work plan, we have a feature called auto actual which will build the job um, with that, with some sort of, not fake, but sort of created as applied data to simulate what would have happened if that target plan had been created that way. So you can still do it even if you can't get the as applied back in, as long as the prescription's present. But then even if you can't, a lot of jobs are flat rate anyway. So even if you're not doing variable activity, 
gatekeeper will still kind of, you've got these peaks and troughs on you. If you imagine sort of looking at a yield map side on and you going up and down with your yield that way, um, all it's going to do if you don't have um, variable rate data in there, it's just going to sort of chop down the bottom half of that sort of peaks as you looked at it, still leaving you though with those profitable looking areas on the field. So you'll still get a good indication. So yeah, I think the margin maps is still quite good functionality even if you've just got the yield data in there. Great, well, thank you. Um, now the next question we've got is, can I import soil data using the mapping and precision farming package? Uh, yep, fairly straightforward that one. Yes, it is. With either the John Deere devices package or, or the precision farming modules, you can bring in any, any service provider data that you'd be working in there. Brilliant. And then we've got, um, this might be one to come back to, but we've got, what is the best way to import field lists, etc., from multiple farms, each running gatekeeper, ready in time for harvest? Um, I, I saw that one come in and I'm, I'm sort of trying to understand, and I might have misunderstood this, If, if uh, so apologies, Sean, we might need to get in touch with you directly on this one, but I'm presuming that we're talking about contract and operations um, where you, you combine in um, for different growers that are all running their own licenses or gatekeeper, perhaps. Um, I don't know what the guys from John Deere think, but maybe that's something that could be sort of all amalgamated within the centre, perhaps, and then ingested back into a single gatekeeper license. That way might be an option. Um, otherwise, it would be a case of probably something like asking them if they're running Gatekeeper and have the mapping module, publishing their field boundaries across to you in the single Gatekeeper and then just sharing that one data set out with the, um, with, with the, with the combine. But I don't know if the guys have got any other experiences or, or people that are, that, that are doing large contracts and operations with a lot of, um, a lot of different growers combining up different fields. If this was for me to give advice on, I would I would use Op Center, and I'd amalgamate um, a single organisation with the different contract customers, field boundaries, agent lines, everything in there. So you've got that single point of reference that you can take a clean, fresh set of data whenever needed, set that out, and then going back, you can have the partnership set up for that each of the contracting uh, customers get to see their data with them and they can then drag into Gatekeeper. That would be my advice. That's great. Thank you both. I've just had another question just come in and we've got, um, do you margin map, oh, we've had thanks from Sean as well. So <laughs> he says, thanks guys. Um, do margin maps only take data from tasks with spatial data? through the precision farming modules, or can they include non-spatial data jobs as well? That they'll include all jobs. So any anything, as long as it's priced up correctly. So this is where, you know, if you are going to use margin maps and try and take some um, information from them, and you want to be able to trust it. This is where having your stock sorted out or a pricing method allocated correctly and accurately and gatekeeper with closed stock periods, so your pricing's all correct. But no, any job that has products priced correctly in it within gatekeeper will be taken into account. It will just assume that that cost is is for the full area of the field rather than any specific portions where rates have changed. But they, they will, all, all jobs will be taken into account with a margin map. Okay, brilliant. I think I think we'll probably have to take call time on that. If there's any other um, outstanding questions, what we'll do is we'll get back to you guys. And also, um, you'll have this uh, video and and uh, recording again available, so you can you can read look and redigest some of those answers. Um, all what's left really to say is is thank you, Adam, Vicky, Emily, uh, especially thank you for Adrian, um, Chris, and George. Um, a really good session this morning and uh, thank you all attendees as well thank you for your time uh, hopefully you you've taken some um, nuggets away from this and uh, you found it really really beneficial uh, it's sort of watch this space with regards to some more uh, pre-harvest um, sessions that we've got and also uh, into the autumn and after harvest we'll be looking to do some of these within the data and tech series so uh, thank you all again and uh, hope to see you again soon thanks very much Bye-bye now. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.